and we are live on the frugal crafters youtube channel i am lindsay here with sarah today Hello. and we're going to do a watercolor of this beautiful parrot tulip and um, we're actually going to try to keep the background white if we have a spill or a splash we can always put a background in later but i think it would be really pretty to um to just have that white background and i wanted to um take a second to just i wanted to put this reference photo here it's from pixabay so i can show it on screen um and just show you the difference between like a bleached paper which is like your, your printer paper and a natural watercolor paper so it does look kind of off-white and some people had asked me about um a listing where it said off-white paper and you know that's a natural white sometimes places call it off-white for some reason but the natural white paper is a little bit a little bit darker i have a printable pattern that you can download on my website if you want to go check it out and that way you can um, just transfer that on it's always a good idea to either draw on a scrap of paper and transfer it on um, instead of just drawing directly on your watercolor paper if it's anything complex at all so you don't end up having to erase and damaging the paper we're going to use um, a fairly limited palette today I just got this little porcelain palette and I wanted to try it out but I've got quinacridone red or quinacridone rose it's kind of like a um, um, kind of pinkish red a cool red lemon yellow or hints of yellow light and I've got you can use olive green or sap green and then we've got a plate to mix on so I thought I would use the color the supplies that I was using in my brand new watercolor course that just went live and I'm so excited <laughs> and there's details in that on my blog and in the video description if you want to go take a look but I do have it on sale this month for $39 regular $79 so you know if you want to pick it up for Mother's Day or maybe learn a new skill so you can paint mom something for Mother's Day that would be a good opportunity and I basically just wanted to boil down all the foundational stuff that you may have missed if you've never taken like a um, a lead watercolor course just pretty much responding to what uh, subscribers and viewers have asked me over the years to do so so that is available now um, we're gonna start by doing some washes on the flower oh and I want to mention if you have questions type the word question in all caps and um, try to keep your questions watercolor related and Sarah can relay them to me or one of the moderators can help you if it's something that has been asked quite a bit so I'm going to start by wetting this petal over here with clean water and I've got a number 12 round you could use anywhere in the ballpark between like an 8 and a 12 you don't want to go too small because it's going to take you too long to cover that area and i'm just going to wet these these petals are kind of complex because they kind of fold over and they've got splits in them and they're very ruffly so i just want to make sure i'm only wetting this one petal here you want to make sure you have a paper towel handy too to blot your brush because you don't really want puddles you just want to even kind of satin sheen on your paper uh lorraine and brian van hetterin Mm -hmm. Hi from Canada. I received two blocks of hot press paper as a gift and I hate it. Is there anything I can do to it to make it more like cold press paper? Um, hot press, you know, this would be a good project in hot press paper because it's so smooth and you can get the details. Um, I don't, you know, I guess I'd have to see what you're, what's bothering you about it. Is it the fact that it tends to buckle more? Um, probably stretching it. If that's the case, then you can, um, you can get a little bit more usability from it um, if you do any crafting like if you do rubber stamping hot press paper is ideal for rubber stamping so if you don't rubber stamp and you might want to borrow a, a friend's stamps so you could stamp a few things out and uh, then watercolor it or print it on a laser printer and watercolor it and make some quick cards um, but you know sometimes it just takes a little getting used to hot press isn't my favorite either unless I'm stamping but I really love it for stamping I'm going right up along the edge of this petal with the green because you're going to see a variety of colors in each petal. Um, it's kind of what makes the parrot tulip so pretty. And I think I do want to do my lines with a credit card scraper because it's so easy. I just got to dig mine out here. And this is just, you take an old gift card or credit card or whatever, cut it up into little pieces, and then you can use that to scribe lines. And I have sketched a few of them on the pattern if you want them to go by or just look at the reference photo. But basically, you're going from all the lines go from the spine in the center vein to the outside edge. So you just want to make sure that you are getting that movement. You're, you're pulling those lines in that direction. Otherwise, it's going to look a little awkward. And if you don't want to do that with a scraper, you can wait and do it later with a fine brush, with a liner brush. 
Now, while I'm kind of in this initial wash stage, I want to get a little bit of pink on the tips of the flower. So I'm going to use this um, quinacridone red. This I just squirted this out, so I have to be careful not to get too much. A little bit of that. I'm still using that number 12 brush. You can go smaller if you want to. just want to blot off any extra, especially on the ferrule. I don't want to get um, that paint. I don't want beads dripping down. And I'm just going to pull in some from the edge. Uh, Tammy Stover. Newbie here. What's the best watercolor brush? If you're, well, I, you know, there's two that I recommend, these Mimics right here, and they're linked in the video description. They're very soft and absorbent, so if you are brand new, these might give you a little bit of grief. Um, I also like the Royal and Langnickel Majestic line. Um, so if you are a brand new beginner, I think I would recommend that just because of how um, they don't hold quite so much water, so you will not have issues with, you know, water gushing out of your brush when you're trying to control it or or too weak of paint if you're you know trying to work with it i don't want this to feather out too much so i'm just going to gently blot it and i think i want to warm up that pink a little bit that red so i'm actually going to mix a little of this hansy yellow light with my red and that will warm it up a little bit and we add a little bit of that in some of these areas, just kind of let it float out a little bit. And I am going to drag the uh, the color back with the credit card scraper, not a ton, just a little bit. Now, just keep in mind, whenever you scrape on wet paper, you're going to be inscribing it. So any washes that you put on top will sink into those lines and uh, be visible. I think I'm going to grab a little ultramarine blue. That was kind of a maybe color. I think I might move this other palette. It's kind of jiggling and making some noises on me. And I seem to have plenty of room to mix on this one because we're not doing any really big washes. And I'm going to take a little bit of the red, a little bit of the yellow, and just make kind of like a really, really watery neutral gray color. And it's going to be neutral because I'm using the other colors I have here. I'm going to add some of that in between because I feel like the white is just too white and I want the background to, sh to stand out a little bit. Now with cotton paper, I don't have to worry about my paints back running that much because um, it's a more absorbent paper, so the paint's not staying on top and slipping and sliding and um, kind of running into each other. So that's kind of a nice, uh, nice aspect of cotton paper. Uh, Dazzle Desire, what would you recommend for a first set of watercolors? Um, this set right here, if you can swing it for what, you know, it is kind of expensive for the size of the tubes, but, um, this is $22 on Amazon yesterday. It's usually a little bit more, but you can usually find it for under 30. Um, it, a little goes a long way and the colors are great for mixing because you get two of each primary. So if you can swing it, I think you're better off to get this than to spend, you know, $22 on, um, like a set of the Primo ones, just because you don't know what's in it, and these aren't going to fade, and these are, uh, you know, they're going to go longer for because there's more pigment in them. Um, but I also like the Cotman Sketcher set. That's it's uh, the colors aren't quite as intense, but they it's affordable, and you get those two of every color plus these the other um, the other kind of convenience mixes that I recommend. So it it just kind of pulls down to what you want to spend. I think the Cotman one was around twelve dollars um, on Amazon. So you know you can't. You can't beat that either. That's a great travel set. So I think it just depends on on your budget and are you going to feel, is it going to bother you to paint with? Sometimes you don't want to paint with something that's too expensive because it makes you feel like you have to conserve it instead of like painting and practicing. If you have paint already, that's the best paint for you to use. I'm wetting this big petal here on this side, 
And we're going to repeat those washes. Cindy Patton, I'm looking at the less expensive Daniel Smith watercolor sticks. How do you use them? Do you cut off pieces? Can you get pieces to stay in a palette? Yeah, those are actually, I really recommend the uh, the watercolor sticks because I have a few of those, especially the Primatex because like some of those are crazy expensive in a tube, but all the sticks are priced the same. I really like them. I slice off a, a piece and I stick it in my palette. Uh, fromage. What's your favorite watercolor technique? Wet on wet or wet on dry? It depends on what I'm painting. But probably probably more, I'm more apt to go wet on wet because I like the uh, kind of the more fluid aspects. I'm going to grab some of this, this uh, Hansa Yellow Light, or you can use Lemon Yellow if that's what you have. It's a cool yellow. That's the only thing to keep in mind. And I'm kind of putting this... Um, kind of like a third of the way across on this petal. And I'm gonna put some over here on the other third that's kind of wrapping around. It's funny, doing the, the class, I actually used um, just a very basic palette in this plate that I got at the Dollar Tree for my palette. And I really liked it. I really liked having the, them kind of like, as I used them more like that, kind of like having them fresh and on their own, it was kind of, um, it's kind of fun so and it kept me from like dipping into other colors and you know bringing more complication into the mix than i needed to uh kendall mccauley i am attempting to paint a smooth shiny vegetable an eggplant but i'm having a hard time getting the shiny areas to look shiny what tips do you have um probably the first tip would be maybe use some masking fluid and mask out your brightest highlights and then let that dry and then build up light layers. Um, some that, there's like, a, I've seen this time lapse and I wish I could remember who did it. If anybody knows, please put it in the chat or the comments if you're watching the replay. There's an account I follow on Instagram. And I don't know if it's like watercolor tutorials or if it's an actual artist's um, uh, page, but um, but they do time lapses all the time. And then they, they've done peppers before and like desserts and things. And it's just really neat to see it all like come together, you know, probably a painting that took four hours come together in like 30 seconds, but you see the layers, the light layers they build up and it's really cool. But it, it's a, you know, like mask off your lightest color, put a pale, pale wash that would be like the cast reflection, then just keep working on in layers until you get it as dark as you want. So I obviously did some olive green or sap green in the middle. I'm actually going to mix um, some ultramarine with some of that sap green to get even a darker green. This palette's so cute. <laughs> I've wanted a porcelain palette for so long, but they're usually so expensive. But I saw this for four bucks on Consumer Crafts. And I'm like, I'm getting that. I need to get <laughs> I need to get for free shipping anyway when I ordered my markers last week. There you go. Uh, Kia Vasalo, what makes a bigger difference, high quality paint or high quality paper? Uh, I'd say high quality paper. I mean, it might fade if you don't use high quality paint, but the, the experience of painting, definitely the paper. So I put that darker green in the center there. Um, just a few streaks of it. We're gonna go in and refine more in a bit, but I wanna get all those colors in there. I felt like that looked a little flat over there, so we'll have to put some washes on. Um, and now I'm gonna go back in with my pink along some of the edges. Now there is quite a bit of white in here, so I don't wanna cover everything. Uh Gracie Shack, I have trouble using a credit card scraper with the Fabriano Artistico hot press paper. Any idea why that might be? Hmm. Um, no, because I've used, well, I don't have the, fa I have the Artistico soft press and cold press, and I haven't had an issue with any of those. Hmm. Is it like, what's her problem? Is it uh, she tearing? Say. If you, uh, Gracie, if you could let me know if it's like tearing your paper or just not leaving marks. Um, if it's not leaving marks, it's probably, maybe you're used to working on a paper that's not quite as durable. And so you are, you're being too gentle with it and it's not leaving a mark or, um, or it could be if, if it's tearing, you're being too rough with it, I'd say. But it could just be you're being too gentle if that's like if you're not used to using like a, a durable paper. Okay. I think I'm 
going to wet over this one over here. And actually, let's do some scraping on this while we're at it. There aren't as many uh, visible lines over here, but I do want to just put in a few because I did it to the other side. We're going to do a lot of brush work here in, uh, in glazes, so I don't want to get too crazy with the washes. But I'm going to re-wet this and we'll do, this is dry, so I can do another another glaze on top. Maybe I'll just go ahead and mix my color before I go over there. So I'm going to grab some of this um, Hansa Yellow Light and just kind of glaze over this whole green area. I feel like I didn't get it quite bright enough and pull some of the, uh, some of the yellow out towards the pink. Just if you use the tip of your brush, you can get in there with your number 12 mimic. Um, if you're feeling like it's it's just too big of a brush, you can switch to something smaller. It's whatever's comfortable for you. Tina Tomaszewski, can you get the same effect while using the watercolor brushes? Oh, probably means water brushes? Yeah, water brushes. Um, you can, you just need to, you know, you can always empty a water brush out too and use it like a regular brush if you're having like issues with it feeding too much water. Um, yeah, you just want to, you just want to make sure that it's not going to like drop a, like a load of water where you're working. That's the biggest thing with a water brush. Um, the Koi have nice fine tips, like the Koi fine tip is really, is really nice. I do find my water brushes for whatever reason, it could just be because they get Put through harsher conditions being in my like travel bag but it seems like my water brushes don't last as long as my regular brushes and they lose their sharpness it seems like but it could just be you know the the, the way i use them they get used a little more rougher uh janine elise pike how do you stick a piece of the daniel smith stick in your palette sometimes like um when i was make, making my travel palette and i'm going to just take a little yellow a uh, little olive green and ultramarine blue here to make a dark stem color. Um, I took actually, I had a, the same color from another brand. I scored it a little bit in the pan and I stuck the, the uh, slice into that so it would, um, so it would adhere. But you could just kind of wet the bottom of the stick and shove it in a pan or, you know, or just like slice off a piece and just spritz your well of your palette and stick it in that way. The gum arabic will make it sticky. It's basically like a pan of watercolor. It's the same stuff. It's just cheaper the way that, like, if you buy it that way, which is nice. Okay, now I'm going to dry this with a heat tool so I can work on that middle petal. So if you have any questions, go ahead and pop them in the chat and I can answer you while I am drying. I just realized my heat tool has a, has a little hook on the side so I can hang it. I didn't know that until I was cleaning my office. <laughs> got little, look at that. It's got a little hook on it. I can have a little oh. S hook under my desk. Did you know that? Yep. Yeah. Oh. I mean, I, well, I mean, I don't hang mine because I don't have, because I have a place to store it. So, yeah. But yeah, I've used it. I've, I'm, I've used it before. Uh, Gracie shot back to the trouble with the credit card. It says it peels. It peels when she tries to do it. Um, make sure when you slice with it, you are. Um, hang that back up. Um, make sure that you're slicing like this, and you're not going. You know, you're you're going with the skinniest. You're dragging the skinniest part. If that part has frayed at all, just cut it again so that you get a nice sharp edge and use that. Um, so it just sounds like it's you're braiding it too much. Um, so just just make sure you're you're slicing and not dragging. So now I'm going to wet this middle petal here. Same idea as what we've been doing. How many people do we have hanging out with us today? Uh, we're at 348. Oh, nice. I think people are looking forward to watercolor after oils last week. <laughs> Back to the regular scheduled program. <laughs> yeah. I really had fun playing with those oils last week, though. I had five people emailed me to buy the painting. Oh, nice. Uh, 
uh, Lexi V116. I have a very small workplace that I work on, so I use travel set watercolors. What is another good price set that I can use? I have the Koi set already. Um, looking for a good price travel set. Let's see. If you have the Koi set, and that's about this on the same level as like the Prima um, and the Jane Davenport watercolors. They're very, very comparable. So if you want something very different, um, you could try like the um, the St. Petersburg, the Arca St. Petersburg. They're quite a bit more transparent than the than the Koi. Um, you could try the Cotman Sketcher Box if you're looking for another travel size thing. Or, the, you know, honestly, if you're starting to run out of paint, it wouldn't hurt to try a few tubes of different colors that you've never used before from different brands and see what you really like. Because there's so many out there. There's, you know, everybody. And everybody likes slightly different characteristics, too. So if you try a few different brands, you might see that, well, I really like Core, or I really like Windsor Newton, or I really like Sennelier. But you wouldn't necessarily know that if you never tried them. Come on, away from the cat box. Oh, wait. She was trying to get away with something. Well, she's, you know, <laughs> right next to the cat box. I don't trust her. We're going with some dark um, of the quinacridone red. Pretty strong. And I want to get a really nice deep edge against the edges we previously painted. So that's why we needed it dry there. You can even leave a little uh, barrier of white, a little gap if you want to. Uh, Jennifer Hopping, when you glaze, do you progressively use less water or is the same water to paint ratio with each glaze? I find that when I glaze, I lose some of the previous layers. Any suggestions? Um, that happens depending on the paint that you're using, like certain pigments want to lift a lot more than other pigments, so you have to be careful there. And um, like a color like quinacridone red, for instance, if you have that underneath, that's that's a great color to have underneath because it, it stains the paper. It's not going to um, let you pull the color out as much, but if you have like burnt sienna or ultramarine underneath, those colors are going to be more prone to movement after they're dry, after you if you rewet them, so that's one of the big, the big things to remember when you're glazing. I don't think there's a set water amount. I'm usually I usually want it fairly watery because I want to make sure I retain that transparency. It's usually about the consistency of um, I would say skim milk. When I when I glaze, I find that that works pretty well. And of course, depending on the pigment that you're using, some of those colors. Are going to be extremely bright at skin milk consistency and some are going to be very weak so um, you could change up the color so that you can get that consistency uh, but probably your paper has a lot of sizing in it and that's giving you some grief or your the whatever you painted underneath uh, might have a lot of fillers in it or it might just be a granulating color that tends to lift i'm just flicking my brush here because I want to soften the uh, fade between the edge to the center, but I, I know I'm going to put green in there, so I can't bring it in too far or I'm going to have a mess, a muddy mess. So that's what I'm just doing there, just kind of feathering it. Um, student grade paints are harder to glaze with because of the fact they have so much filler in them. They make It makes them kind of sit on top of the paper instead of sinking in, which makes it actually nice for students because it's easy to lift the, those colors up when they need to, but it can make it a little bit frustrating if you're trying to glaze. Uh, Carrie Cuddlefuss, I've just switched over to professional paints and mimics this month, and I'm having problems picking up too much pigment or putting down too thick. Any suggestions on keeping the transparency? My suggestion would be to let the make sure you let your paints dry out in a palette before you use them, and then, um, and I think that's gonna help you because generally, that's what happens when a lot of people when you switch over because you're so used to having to really work to get your color out with a student grade that when you go over to the professional grade you're um, you're still expecting to have to dig for those colors and I want as much color as I get over here so now I'm just gonna clean my brush and actually I think I'm gonna move over to a stiffer brush I'm gonna use this uh, synthetic mimic because it's a little stiffer and I can drag those colors out a little easier without adding a bunch of water to the mix and that way I won't end up with backgrounds or cauliflowers. 
Uh, Janine Elise Pike, can the Daniel Smith sticks also be used to draw like the intense sticks? They do not work as well for drawing. They're, uh, they want to gum up and almost like, like uh, they almost want to ball up and gum up when you try to use it. It's like, it'd be like trying to draw with a pan of watercolor. It does, it does not work as well. Uh, the American Journey watercolors work really good for uh, for sketching with, and they've got really good pigmentation and light fast pigments. Um, also, the Karen Dosh crayons work good, but I don't know what their pigment situation is. I've never seen that listed, but it is Karen Dosh, and they tend to be pretty good. Now I'm going to go in with the um, with the bright yellow here, the Hansa yellow light, and I'm going to go in and drag some of that up the middle and kind of fade it out into the pink mix. The worst thing that will happen if they mix in with the pink too much is it'll get a brighter red because they'll combine a little bit. And they're both such transparent, clean colors that they'll kind of go to red rather than orange. Uh, Blue Today 013, what brand of watercolor paper do you recommend to practice on? I use Canson XL 140 pound. However, I heard it's terrible quality and that I should practice on arches. Um, I don't recommend practicing on arches. It depends, like if you're just going to be doing brush strokes or washes, you know, you're just you're just practicing a technique over and over again, and it's not going to be a finished painting. Um, oh, I would definitely practice on the cheap stuff. My favorite cheap paper for practice is Fabriano Studio because um, it's got 25% cotton content, which makes it a little bit more durable than the um, than the Canton XL, but it's it you know, it's still as cheap. I think, well, it might be a little bit more expensive because the Canton XL can be picked up very, very inexpensively at like AC Moore, but, um, but that's my pick. I also like the, um, if you think like your painting might actually be something that you'll want to keep your, your practice paintings. If you go with like, um, Strathmore Brown Label or Strath Strathmore Wind Power, those are, those are really good for, um, those actually are, are better papers that will hold up to working on them a little bit more. The thing with the Canton XL, it's just, it's not going to hold up to repeated working. So it's great if you just want to stamp an image, color it, and put it on a card. That It'll handle that. But it's not going to handle, you know, too much scraping. It's not going to handle any scrubbing. It's, you know, it's it's a very um, delicate paper. But for practicing, I think it's fine. Canton XL Mixed Media is a little bit more robust, and it's actually cheaper because you get, like, 60 sheets in a pad. So you might even try that. But I, I don't practice on arches. That's good stuff. That that is. Even if I buy it cheap enough, I'm still going to practice on it. I'm going to practice on the, the stuff that I don't care for that much, you know, so it gets used. And you know, if you can control paint, you can, if you can make it look good on crappy paper, your skills are out of this world. And when you go to use good paper, you're really going to notice it. So now I've got a couple little uh, leaf portions kind of poking out. And I want to just give them a little bit of color. I think I will switch to a smaller brush just so I don't get too much water in there. And I'm going to go right in with my quinacridone red. Because it's just kind of the outsides of the petals. And it will help uh, help them stand out. And I'm not, re I'm not wetting them first because it's such a small area. I finally found my mimic liner. I like lost it. Oh, it was in a very overstuffed full brush bucket. <laughs> I was afraid it might have like might have rolled away or got stuck to a piece of tape or something that I had taped paper down to a board with and got tossed away or something. But I was thinking, geez, I'm gonna have to order another one of those. I really like that brush, but I found it. And then we get a couple little spots in here that are pretty dark. We're kind of like seeing on the inside of the flower a little bit. Um, it's mostly green, but to darken that green, I'm going to add a little bit of the um, quinacridone red and a little bit of ultramarine blue. So I'll probably just start off with this mix that I've already got over here with the ultramarine blue and um, olive. And I just had some of that red on my brush anyway, so I just kind of mixed it in there and got a, almost like a brownish gray. And I'm going to add a little bit more green in there and enough water so that it will float off my brush. And I'm going to go in and paint with that. I'll do this 
So I'm going to hit that with a dryer really quick. I shouldn't have hung that back up. I'm just going to leave it out. Any other questions popping up? Uh, well, someone asked where you get the gummed tape, and I said you use the stuff from the Dollar Tree. Oh, the gummed tape isn't at the Dollar Tree. Uh, masking tape is. Oh. But the gum tape, um, <laughs> I've actually bought it a couple places. I picked it up from shipping suppliers. But um, if you have like a, this is odd coming from me, but butcher shop actually sells mm -hmm. the uh, sells the the tape because they that's what they wrap the um, like the paper meat packages up in, and the, they'll have the narrower stuff. And I think I paid like a buck a roll for for it many years ago. I don't know how many butcher shops are there, but the general store in the town where I grew up. Oh, so this was many years ago. If I was back home, but um, but yeah, he he had it right there, so I was able to buy some from him so I could stretch my own paper. So I'm just going in and I'm kind of, I'm not going to paint the whole section, this kind of khaki-ish green color that we mixed. I'm just going to kind of go in the deepest parts of that shadow and then I'm going to clean my brush and I'm going to grab the green, the olive green on its own or sap green, whichever you're using, using is fine. And I'm just going to paint that next to it. Then I'll blend the two together. I'm still not going to go the entire way because I want to get a little yellow in there, but I can work them together a little bit on the edge. Whoop, whoops, oh well, phone's gonna wait. <laughs> Man, I even put them in the other room, they're still pretty loud though. <laughs> well, it's gotta be with a house full of people. That's true. There. So that we get a little bit of depth. I think that really makes that petal start to look um, a little bit more alive. So now I think I'm going to continue on with this brush. Um, I am going to start with this petal where we started. And I'm going to start putting some of the more distinct red um, color in there. And it's not a pure quinacridone red. That's a little too pink. I'm going to take that and just add a little bit of the um, Hansi Yellow to it. Just to not a ton to really like change a color too much just to kind of warm it up a little bit and get that kind of hot pink tone away because that's just a little bit unnatural how bright it is and i'm going to turn my work and i'm going to actually tilt my paper so that hopefully you can see pretty well what i'm doing and i'm going to start at the edge and drag it in And you can, if your brush gets a little kind of dry and you get these sparkly strokes, that's actually good because it will give you that kind of batikish look that these petals have. Now, if you do decide you need some whites in there and you didn't leave them, a very quick and easy fix is to grab a gel pen and uh, draw them in later. So if something happened and you weren't able to keep the white you wanted to, that's always a um, an option. Go and pull those in a little bit further. I think I just hit the microphone. Sorry about that, guys. And this is a number four round. And you could use anywhere between like a number, uh, number two to a number six, depending on what you're comfortable using and what you happen to have. You don't have to have every size. I think that's a misconception. People think they need every brush out there, but you don't, you know, and everyone has their own little, their own little preference to what they like. Best step 469. Have you used graphite transfer paper for watercolor? During tracing, will the paper get smudged from my hand pressure moving around the paper? Will the line smudge when wet? Um, the line shouldn't smudge in the wet because they have a trace amount of wax in there that, that should keep it from smudging. Um, but the you can transfer, like, especially fingernails, if you, like, rub your fingernail or um, you scrape across it. It's usually not too bad, though. I mean, you're not just going to rest your hand and have a transfer. It's not like carbon paper. The, the, they need the pressure to transfer. I'm doing the same thing except from the opposite side with olive green. Um so I haven't I haven't run into any issues with that. And definitely not as much as like a regular pencil smudges. 
uh, L O T R Potter Girl. What are your thoughts on spiral bound versus the gum side tablets for practicing? I'm assuming she means the books. Yep. Um, for a sketchbook, for a watercolor sketchbook, I actually like the um, the spiral bound because they lay flatter and they don't come apart, so you can actually store everything right in that notebook and then you can look back through at your progress as you go along and it's kind of satisfying to go back and that way you don't have to worry about where to store your finished um your finished things so i'm a big fan of that actually now on this i'm actually going to drag some green out from that little seam because these uh these petals kind of have like they have like splits but it's, it's one petal but there's like very deep grooves they go between the sections, so I'm going to pull some of those green lines out from the outside line that I put there on the pattern. And it might, but you can hear my brush. I think um, I can hear it. It's dry. It's very dry. So it, it's almost like hear it whispering on the paper. And what gives parrot tulips that that striated roughly look is a lot of the veining so you want to make sure that you kind of pull some of these green lines up into the red area so they're kind of side by side and that color vibration where you have opposites red and green next to each other also give it the vibrancy that is no is like really um, a trademark of these, these types of flowers Thank you, Leo. Quiet the chat. Is you guys the moderators just on top of everything, or there, well, there haven't been a ton of questions, oh. but uh, lots of chat. So I can actually keep up with the questions <laughs> today. I'm grabbing some of the. Uh, I'm just grabbing the Hansa yellow on its own because I have a lot of green in there. I think I've got enough green. I can just kind of go in there and add to, especially this little area here where I have kind of underneath this um, this fold of the petal. <coughs> Excuse me, <clears throat> need a drink. And then if you had any weird wash areas where you could see like the edge of a wash and it didn't like blend seamlessly into the next color, it just kind of dance over that yellow and it will kind of fill in and you won't notice any any weird edges. Hopefully my hand's not in the way while I'm doing this. Uh, Moon Ram, do you see any difference between in ink tets pencils and blocks? I do. I actually prefer the pencils. For me, the, the blocks seem almost a little chalkier. I, I'm wondering if they might have had to put some clay in there or something to help them hold together and not crumble. Um, but I find the it seems to me that the pencils are more transparent. They say it's the same stuff, but I, I find the, the blocks just feel a little chalky to me. So this can be a little, I guess this could get a little tedious for some people, but, um, you know, I think it's kind of fun to build up these streaks. I'm going to grab a little ultramarine blue, and I'm just going to clean an area on this palette, I think, because I want to make a dark green that doesn't have any gray tones to it. So I'm going to use ultramarine blue and olive green to make a very cool desaturated green. So if I wanted a bright green... Um, if I wanted to bright, darken this and brighten it, I would use like a phthalo blue, but I want a desaturated blue. I don't want the, this bluish green. It's almost like a kind of a, a muted blue, green, gray kind of color. So that's why I'm using the ultramarine blue. And I got a fur, something sticking on my brush. Here. <laughs> what was that? Cat hair, probably. That could be some chewy hair. Could be some around. chewy hair. So you just need to pay attention to kind of tones and values. As you're, uh, as you're painting, especially if you're trying to paint something like botanical and realistic. I almost stuck a finger with paint on it on my paper already. I don't know if we're going to make it background free on this or not. <laughs> no, no, you're almost there. Angie, Angie Stoudenmeyer, does Lindsay recommend 90 or 140 pound and hot or cold press for practice? Um, honestly, I practice on 90 pound a lot of the time. There's an Aqua B 90 pound that, um, that I use for practice. I, it will wrinkle, <clears throat> excuse me, it will wrinkle and it's, you know, I, 
if I'm just practicing, no, I don't want, I want to get the kind of the cheapest paper that's going to do the job for me, but um, use whatever you want to use. Uh, you can find, you know, like that Canson XL, and there's, I mean, there's a lot of affordable 140 pound paper that's decent enough uh, and cheap enough for practice. So I'm just going ahead and bringing down some of this color into the stem so I don't have an awkward stopping point. I might as well just go ahead and put that shadow on the stem while I'm at it. And that is ultramarine blue and the olive green again. And it's going to be down the um, right hand side of the stem. You can get confused when you're turning your paper around. So if you turn it right back, right side again, when you're looking at like shadows and stuff, or you could end up, you know, as you're looking back at your reference photo, you could end up getting a little mixed up. So what I'm doing is I'm going to paint this in on the dry paper. I think I kind of like that shadow a little bit stronger. I'm just kind of working it out until I run out of paint there. I think I will go and maybe put a little bit more on the edge. Okay, so you can see kind of the difference in like this petal where we've put the extra work into and the other areas which we haven't. So now I'm going to move over to this guy. I'm going to do the same thing again. We're going to start with our red and just you can probably just add a little water to it you probably have enough left because we didn't use that much watch out for beads on the ferrule blot your brush off there so you don't end up having a you do not want to drip when you're just going in with a little bit of paint to add details that will that could ruin it pretty quickly then you end up like my situation earlier this week with my mixed media lupins <laughs> Uh -oh. pa painting went terribly wrong, so it's like, okay, it's now a mixed media piece. <laughs> you kept adding stuff to it till, till I could uh, get it back to something that looked passable. That's a good thing about art, though. You can always keep adding to it. It's not like a piece of music where you've played it and then everyone's heard you be off tune. Nobody has to see it till you're... That's right. Until you're done, unless you're doing a live YouTube broadcast, then you can't hide anything. Uh, Kitten Gray, I heard you mention Canson Mixed Media. I have used this paper for alcohol markers and had it bleed through the paper a lot. Is it strong enough to hold up to watercolor? Yeah, it's great on watercolor. It's not very good with alcohol pens. I've used it for, I tried it with alcohol pens and I had a really frustrating time with it. It dries, the, the marker dries so quickly. And it just like seeps into the paper and you can't blend it very well. So I definitely would recommend it for uh, for water-based media, but not so much for alcohol. A dog is snoring. <laughs> it's hard being chewy. Well, the other day I was recording and I had my headphones on and microphone on and I'm like, what is that noise? And it was like, it sounded like snoring. And I'm like, well, maybe Frida's in here somewhere because I have a cat who snores. And uh, I couldn't find her anywhere. And I'm looking and I'm like, geez, is she outside? And then so a little while later, she I found her. She was up in the uh, garage up over this room and she was sleeping and snoring. Oh. Like <laughs> there was a wall and insulation between us and I could still hear that cat snore. Well, she's got quite a snore on her. You must have been tired. It's not easy being your cat. There's a lot of in and out and some napping. Yep. Drinking paint water. Yeah. I mean, somebody's got to do it. Full, full busy day. Right out straight. <laughs> Which is a main term for being really busy. <laughs> yeah, straight out. Right out straight and all stove up. <laughs> My lupin painting was all stove up before I was it done. Was all, she was all stove <laughs> she up. She was all stove up. <laughs> gonna be gone to pot. <laughs> so a little touch of red really makes a. I'm sorry, a little touch of yellow in the red really makes a difference, and it really kind of brings the colors to life. I think you need that little contrast of warmth.
Okay, now we're going to go in with the green. Same brush where, you know, as we progress, we're using smaller brushes so we don't affect it quite so much. We're doing more, more uh, gradual layers and turning my paper so I'm comfortable. I'm also going to make sure my hand's clean so I don't drag a dirty hand through there. I like to pull the paint towards me. That's why I'm trying to go at it from this angle versus going at it from up here because I don't I want any thicker lines to be at the base of the flower. So that's just why I'm going that way. And just make sure every stroke that you put down is going with the direction of the veining in the petal. And I got some almost like uh, a little divot here where it shows like the petal kind of dipping in and folding around. Uh, best at 469. I want to add some brown in places to make it look like some wilting. How and where should I do it? Um, I would probably do little touches of burnt sienna and um, probably just the edges, a little edge here and there of some on some of the petals. I've got a pretty distinct ripple over here, so I did turn it back around so I could look at my reference photo going the correct way. Otherwise, I would probably not put it in quite right. Uh, Sarah Gogan, why are you not using much water with the paint now? Because now I'm putting details in, and if I have a lot of water, um, they can kind of morph out, just kind of they get really soft and gushy, and I don't want my... Um, I don't want these lines to be soft and gushy. I want to be them, them to be very um, crisp. I have another tutorial on my channel. It's not a live one, but it is real time. It's kind of long, but there's a lot going in about glazing and layering, and it's a uh, blue jay feather. I posted that uh, last fall. So if you do want a little bit more um, in-depth instruction on this technique, because doing the feather is very similar, these little strokes, give that a whirl, because I think that... Um, that that goes goes pretty in depth on that. Got a like kind of a bumpy edge. I want to smooth that out. Okay, there are some spots where I do want to pull that green a little bit further out, just like I did on the other petal. I'm trying to. I'm kind of painting from the wrist here, kind of rocking my brush back and forth. And if it gets really dry, I get these kind of broken up lines, and those I think look pretty good too. Now I'm going to go in and do the same thing with the yellow that I did on the other one. I'm just taking the pure yellow, and I'm going to be um, rocking it. So my my wrist is my brush is just kind of on my wrist. I do not have a tight hold on this brush. I never have a death grip. It's very very. It's like if you're knitting. It's very fluid. And I think of this yellow as you're going in between. You're going, you're connecting the green to the red. And I, it's kind of, uh, it's kind of a lot of work on this picture, but th that's what those, uh, that's how you get that look of the parrot tulip. That's how you get those, that striation, and that ruffly look. They kind of have these like pinked edges to them. Yeah, I mean, you could leave more white. There's more white in this petal in the reference photo. We could lift out a little bit uh, when we get closer to the end, if you want to. And then we're going to go in with that bluer mix. We're going to take the ultramarine and the olive green again, and we are going to put in our darkest um, streaks and shadows on the flower. They're going to be kind of, I'm actually going to dry it first just to make sure because I don't want to have any weird fuzzy edges. Uh, Elizabeth Marie, what do you do if a painting on crappy practice paper turns out amazing? Is it still not good enough to sell? Oh, I'd sell it. Even your crappy paper is going to be acid free. Even if it's cellulose, they uh, usually make it pH neutral. Or you could scan it and make prints. Think about the stuff you buy at TJ Maxx hang on your wall. Do you think that stuff's like archival and it'll last you forever? No. 
you know? And by crappy, I'm not judging anybody's taste. I'm just saying, you know, mass produced, you know, they're not putting Generic. that on. They're not putting that on like, you know, arches paper. They're, you know, whatever the cheapest stuff they can they can find to do the job. Because you know, they're not they're not looking out for, you know, archivability and home decor stuff. Uh, Alice, Allison Middlemass, do you have any tips for painting portraits in watercolor? I find it difficult to get even tones. Um, you got to work in quite a few glazes, um, hot press paper. I try not to overwork it because that's that's when you get kind of the streaks. Um, I would I would just look for some like a watercolor portrait tutorials and see you know find an artist whose style you really like and then see what techniques they use. Going in with this kind of same dark green color in any place, I see that there should be like like a division in the petals, like maybe they fold over one another. I'm putting in those shadows. I figured I'm going to do it right now while I have it on my brush while I'm thinking of it. It's like it's a great shadow color too because when you glaze it over the red, there's enough blue in that that it keeps it from going muddy. Amber Paglinski, have you ever used water soluble graphite and have you ever used it with watercolor? Uh, yes, I have a uh, tutorial of a squirrel on my channel where I use water soluble graphite. Too much water there. Oh, drop my good thing I didn't drop them on the background. <laughs> We're so, have a white background. So close to the end here. Uh, Starshine Soldier, when you paint complicated paintings like this tulip today, do you already have a plan in your head or do you just paint it and it turns out so well because of experience? Uh, well, I've, I have a bit of a plan anytime I like go live just so that I don't waste people's time. But um, I, I, a lot of it comes down to experience because, you know, you know, you just know how you're going to get certain effects the more that you, the more that you paint. Uh, Judith Taylor, I went to a demo at Blix. They had tons of the picture left and let me take a pile home. It was Arches 140 pound cold press. Can I paint on the reverse side? Yes, it's Arches can be painted on both sides. I couldn't remember. I knew we had talked about that. But I was like, can yeah, there the arches? most papers you can. There's some okay. some are ar arsh arsh arsh. Um, I know. <laughs> uh, most pa most papers you can. There's there's some like handmade papers that you can't like. Maybe they only size one side or something, but for the most part you can. Mixing up some more of that ultramarine blue and olive because I uh, used a bunch of it up. There we go. If you get a mix that's a little wetter than what you want, just load your brush up anyway and just touch it onto a towel to blot off the extra moisture. She says, but it's a door. I must go through it. There could be something on the other side. I, re I cleaned my office last week so we can actually open the back door because I had a big table pushed up against it and weather stripping on it for our very long yes. winter. So long. Whenever you're going in with a dark streak on this lighter this lighter area, just make sure it's where you really want it because there's not much you can do about it once you have it down. Uh, Lama Hef, is it normal for blue watercolors to granulate? I own pretty high quality ones and they still granulate a little. Well, yeah, cobalt and ultramarine are going to granulate, and that's that's one of their markers. Um, I love granulating colors. The student grade paints granulate because they have a lot of filler in them. Artist grade paints granulate because that's a property of the pigment. And you can tell when you buy your paints. Usually, um, let me see if these have it. Let's see if any of these say on the tube. A lot of times they'll say, if they're staining or granulating on the tube, if not on the tube, they usually will say on this display where you're buying it, and it will say, um, it will say, 
on the website when you're when you're purchasing them. If it's if you're buying it from an art website, if you're buying it from Amazon, a lot of times they don't have that information. But you can quickly, you know, look on um, Jerry's Artorama or Blick and get that information. So that's nothing to do with the quality. Just some like those blues. I think Prussian might even granulate. In the throne might granulate. A lot of blues are cobalt. Have a cobalt base to them, and the and cobalt seems to granulate. So it just depends on the minerals they're made from. Doing this the same thing we did before, just try to keep keep your um, mind to where your veins are going. Get that center spine and everything kind of kind of curves towards that. You just want enough water on your brush so that the paint will slide off, but you don't want enough that it's going to puddle. And up here, the, my curve's going to go a little bit opposite because of the way that part of the petal is curving. Uh, Diane Murray, I was wondering if 300 pound is mostly for watercolor. I was able to get a sample from Try It, Buy It. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Usually 300 pound is on watercolor paper because it's uh, it's that thick to res you know, re resist warping when it's wet. I use it sometimes, and I don't use it very often because I'm kind of stingy. I have some of it, but it's uh, I would probably save it for larger paintings because uh, that way I wouldn't have to stretch it and it wouldn't buckle on me. It also um, is more absorbent, so you might find yourself needing to put a lot more water on there when you're working. Karen Emmeth, how do you know when to stop? I always seem to go too far with the details and it ends up looking overdone. Well, that's why you switch to a smaller brush as you go, so you can't do too much before, you know, if you do go overboard, you haven't gone that far overboard. And overboard for some person isn't even finished for somebody else, so it's personal, personal preference. I think the more you paint, the more you'll figure out where exactly you fall as far as your preference. I'm going to grab a little bit of ultramarine, I think, um, with that red and make myself kind of like a darker color I can put underneath that, in with these streaks underneath this petal. So I'm painting it on that petal. I'm going to do the ultramarine and that quinacridone red. It's making me a little bit of a purple. I'm cooling that down and darkening it a little bit. And that is going to go kind of underneath. Ashley Smith, if you have a watercolor palette that you open and have squeezed out the tube color and it's been closed on a shelf for over a year, will the paint still be good to re-wet? Oh, yeah. Elizabeth Marie, you've talked about getting kids into art. Do you think it's wrong or unfair to take the black paint out of my three-year-old's palette? Her paintings end up all black in the end. Um, oh, I think that's up to you. I mean, you could always just give her black on or on its own to, to uh, paint some paintings with and then, you know, give her the colors for the other. I mean, I don't, I, I don't think they'd probably mind. I just had a, a four year old in my mixed age group class this week. And um, they're just, they're just at this age making marks and having fun and experimenting um just giving them the access to the supplies is great i don't think you need to worry too much beyond that um if you think that the child's upset having a black painting then you remove it from the palette i don't think it will do any harm either way as long as you let her do her thing then i think you're fine this is just olive green here It's starting to come to life now. Uh, Terry J. Dime Store Diva TV. I just got mail 
Strathmore Ready Cut 500 Series 100% Cotton Paper. Have you tried it? No, I haven't, but their 400 Series is pretty good, so I bet their 500 Series is, is better. It usually goes up in quality, but like the 300 Series is the, the yellow paper, yellow label pads, which I, I don't really care for that much. Um, the 400 Series are the brown label ones that are really good. I haven't used the, uh, the 500. I've never seen it for sale. Um, in my local stores, and I don't think I've noticed it online before. So let us know how you like it. I bet it's pretty good. I'm going into the yellow. So just repeating the same, the same step with this middle flower. And the yellow goes between the green and the pink. Just kind of dance it in there, here and there. Any big plans this weekend, Sarah? Uh, yeah, I'm going uh, on a bachelorette party. Oh, nice. Tomorrow down in Portland. <laughs> That'll be fun. Oh, it's going to be something, all right. <laughs> uh, Kendall McCauley, can you remind me your views on selling artwork based on your tutorials? I know you said it, but I can't remember where. Um, it doesn't bother me. Go right ahead. The only thing I ask is that you don't um, submit it for publication to a magazine because um, it, it wouldn't be an original idea of yours. You could get in trouble for that. Um, and also, I send my work to magazines often, so um, so that would reflect poorly on on uh, both of us probably. But but that's the only uh, that's my only restriction. It doesn't bother me. So yeah, I'll stop by in the morning and drop off Jason's birthday gift since I Oh yes, here. yep. So I have to drive a card and a gift for him. Stop by in the morning. Yeah, I'm not sure if we're gonna end up with um with any softball, baseball games or anything this weekend or what? It's supposed to be rainy, I think. It is. It's supposed to be mostly rainy. I think maybe a little break Sunday. Which, you know, trades around the old port and rain will be interesting. <laughs> oh, you'll be time. Of us. No, it'll be fine. I just, I'm thinking about some of the people that are coming. It's going to be, it's going to be entertaining. Man, I've been to a bridal shower in forever. No, no. Oh, my. Bachelorette, bachelorette party. party. Totally different. There's no grandmas at the bachelorette party. <laughs> you know, I don't think I've ever been to a bachelorette party now that I think about it. <laughs> we didn't do that in my day. No. <laughs> Well, this is this is uh, this is gonna be a good one. We got some fun games planned. We got we're gonna go out to dinner and then have some drinks. So thank goodness for Uber. <laughs> Get us back to our hotel. That's right. I had to ride my first Uber in Denver last year, and I was kind of freaked out. So I'm thinking this could be like some axe murderer and. I was not, I was, it was fine, but I was like, I was freaked out about it. All right, so I just want to do a little bit of a kind of like shading on this middle petal. Um, the shadow's coming from the outer petal, and then, um, actually, you know what, let's see if I, let's maybe lift a few things first before we do any shadows. Uh, I've got my favorite little lifting brush, my Maxine's Mop. I'm having a hard time finding the quarter inch ones. I'm thinking um i've seen the half inch one no three eighths i've seen three eighths a lot but the quarter inch ones i'm having a hard time locating for people i think i saw them at artist club uh online but um i don't know if they still have them or not could you pass me that a tissue a couple tissues from that box i'm out of like paper towels thank you uh carrie cuddlepuss I've been looking for a cyan, uh, cyan and can't seem to find a tube. I think it's PB17. Is there another name that it goes by, or is there a very close color? You can do any of the phthalo blues, like PB15 would work. Um, I Marry Me, uh, Memory, I'm saying it wrong, blue, it's M-E-R-I-M-E-I, -E -E or something like that. Blue paint, I believe, makes a cyan. And it's they have like an introductory set that has cyan, magenta, primary yellow, and... 
I think like burnt sienna and something else. Um, and that's actually the only cyan I have is from that company. Ashley Smith, have you ever tried the Silver Brush Company Black Velvet Watercolor Brushes? And if so, are they decent quality for their price point? I've heard they're good. I don't know how much they cost, and I've never tried them. So, so a lot of help I am. <laughs> but I'm sure somebody probably has in the chat. They could they could uh, tell you. I heard sil Silver Brush Company is supposed to be excellent. I don't know why I haven't. Why I've never came across them. I mean, as far as using them. So the lifting will lighten things up a little bit. It's more going to soften your streaks more than anything. So if you use it, just kind of just kind of keep that in mind. Best for just kind of softening areas and slightly lightening them. But with the colors that we have here, they're pretty uh, they're pretty strong. And I am going to now go in and add some shadows. So I think I'm going to go with my quinacridone, quinacridone red and a little of that greenish blue mix that I had made. And then probably a little bit more ultramarine blue to cool it down. Gonna end up with kind of like a um, burgundy color. And turning my work so that I can really get in where I want to get in and just defining the uh, edges. I think I'll actually grab another brush to do the spreading out of the color. Uh, Blue Today 013. When creating in realistic style, how do you avoid getting lost in creating every detail? Are you painting what you see or are you painting shapes and shadows? Well, I always start out really vague and then I refine as I go. So at any point when I feel like I'm happy with the way it looks, I can stop. And every layer that I do, everything that I add, I'm adding less every time. So I'm not going to end up with like one part of my picture really done, detailed, and then nothing on the rest of it, you know? Um, so everything's kind of coming up to this level of detail at once. And when you kind of switch over to smaller brushes as you go, you can't really affect too much. So like I was mentioning earlier to another viewer that you can't really overdo it in this method because you, you're putting in such small amounts of paint towards the end that, um, that's not really gonna make that much of an impact. You know, if I, you know, if I did this, did this, little shadowing all over it's such a small amount of paint that yeah it's, it's adding some depth but it's not doing so much to it that i've completely lost everything that else else that i've done that makes sense it's just every layer you do you're just doing it's kind of like the 80 20 rule if you've ever heard that it says like 80 percent of the work 20 percent of the work takes you 80 percent of the way so 20 percent of the work would be like those initial washes getting all that color down and then the rest, the, the, the remaining 80% that we're putting in there, every every little bit we do is not, um, it's not contributing to 80% of the painting. All, the, all this extra work that we're doing is just con contributing to the remaining 20% of the painting. So 80% of that work is just reflected in kind of the 20% of the painting or 20% of the paint we're putting on. That probably makes absolutely no sense, but that was composing it in my brain it did so you, basically you're just using such small amounts as you go that you're not going to really mess anything up i guess is do you know what i'm saying sarah or am i completely what i'm sorry i, was, oh. <laughs> I actually wasn't listening i'm sorry i was i was uh someone was talking about having deer eat their hosta oh and last year i put out bars of irish spring soap around my flower garden like tulips and stuff which deer will eat like they'll sweep yeah. off the heads of the flowers oh. and I, I put out irish spring soap around in my garden i never had a deer in my garden oh, or any wow. other no cool. skunks because I, I planted bulbs too so i didn't want anybody to yeah. i didn't want any animals to come dig up bulbs because like yeah skunks and stuff well and uh yeah it worked and oh, irish spring is really cheap yeah and yeah all right so i'm gonna do the same thing on this side now i don't know if you noticed i um, i was concentrating my shadow on the bottom part so i wouldn't necessarily shadow over a petal 
I was kind of going more like underneath. Uh, Patricia Glica says you're making sense. Okay, good. <laughs> People are laughing at me because I said I was paying it's like Lorraine. That's like yeah, that's totally a Lorraineism too. You might need to work in a little more color over here because um, I feel like I kind of had almost a little naked area from where I had done something earlier and it kind of got a little too wet and mushy. So I'm just going to add a little red to that, streak it in. You could do add like a few streaks here just kind of add a few more somewhere else so it kind of matches what you've been doing and we are just about done gosh knock on wood guys i haven't gotten anything on the background yet i've managed to keep it clean Uh, Angel58764, have you done a video just on the shadows of your paintings as I am having trouble on where to put shadows? I couldn't remember if you've done a shadow. Uh, not just shadows. Um, I've only done, uh, you know, that as part of another tutorial. Starshine Soldier, what is a good watercolor that lifts easily and doesn't really stain the paper? I want to try to tint my own masking fluid, and I don't want to accidentally stain my reserved white space. Um, I would try probably Cotton, which is the Windsor Newton uh, student grade line. And then at this point, if you see that you need a little bit extra of this or that, you can go ahead and throw it in. I feel like I still need a little more yellow over here, so I'm just streaking some of that in. Just um, try to avoid the mud because green and red are opposites. So when they get on top of each other, they will get muddy. If they get next to each other, they just look nice and vibrant, which is kind of what you want with this. And I think that is done. What do you think? So I think so. I think you? if you keep, it's going to get too futzy. Yeah, I think so. So I would probably sign my name over here because it's um, kind of a balance of the picture a little bit but there you have it a parrot tulip by request actually i've had a couple people request this over the years so i thought this would be a good time to do it i think that is a uh, sure about i didn't miss any last minute questions sure, sure i'll gavel my class a little bit for a few minutes um and also if you did lose your whites and you wanted to go in and add some more whites you could always use white gouache paint or you could use um, a gel pen gel pen would be great for getting little streaks in there if you wanted to or you could i would i would definitely let it sit for a bit and see what you think the next day before you go in and do that. Um, my new watercolor course, Essential Tools and Techniques for Watercolor Painters, is um, live. There's a link in the video description. It's on sale for the month of May. Make, would make a wonderful Mother's Day gift. Um, it's on sale for $39, regular $79. And I have... Um, encapsulated pretty much everything you need to know to get started painting. So I try to distill all of the, my, my most useful tips and techniques and um, exercises that you can do, uh, different DIY tools you can make, very simple supplies. And, um, and I think there's a lot of content in there. And then we reinforce everything with three real-time um, relaxed paced uh, watercolor tutorials at the end of the course. So it's over five hours of content and I do hope you check it out. And um, if you do, I'll see you in the classroom over there and I'm looking forward to it. So thanks everyone for hanging out and painting with me today. Thank you, Sarah, for yes. helping out in the chat. Of course. Help. Thanks Excuse all the me. moderators. No, I wasn't listening. I got busted. I was not listening. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> That's all right. It's the weather. Yes, it is. Blaming the weather. Another great day. <laughs> Thanks so much for watching. Until next time, happy crafting.